Praise the Lord. Thank you, Sarah. Sarah Sarah's saying that up there at the campus this morning. He just had send her over here. Amen? <laughs> so. And plus, it was such a good introduction to my sermon. <laughs> uh, as I was talking about uh, our need for the Lord. And I find that so many Christians are, are kind of living on one plane. And I think a lot of times that they don't really understand what happens to them when they give their life to the Lord Jesus Christ and the radical change that, that obviously takes place in a person's heart and in a person's life when they do commit themselves to the Christ, to the Christ Jesus the Lord. Now, the book of Ephesians is a great book, although it's not my passage. There is a scripture that kind of leads into what I want to talk to you about today where he talks about how we're serving the Lord together and we're honoring Christ and being unified. He says, and we're per persevering until we come into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto that perfect man. And he goes on to say, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, what's that mean? That means that we're, we're growing collectively, we're growing individually to be all that God wants us to be. But you know what I find so often in the church is kind of like the Corinthian church where you had a group of people who'd come and given their life to the Lord, had made a commitment 
and salvation experience had taken place, but they really hadn't discovered this, this, this life and what it fully meant. And their church was filled with lots of division, lots of immaturity, lots of carnality, and people just weren't growing in Christ. And Paul's first letter to the Corinthians is a pretty scathing letter, uh, but it's all out of love and all of compassion. But he certainly deals with the issues that need to be dealt with for this church because they weren't being where they were called to be. And part of it was, well, he called them carnal. You know, they just hadn't, hadn't grown in Christ Jesus. They, they'd known the Lord for a, the time enough to have grown, but it's in chapter 3, he corrects them. He says, you know, he said, when you first, I first came to you, you were carnal, you know, which means it's like babes. He said, but you're still carnal. In other words, like, and that's word that means more like immature. In other words, you've had time to grow into, you know, some kind of at least teenagers, <laughs> but you're still not there. You're still, you're still infants spiritually. And I really believe that that's a great picture of where so many churches are today. And you think about it, you say, well, what is the big problem? I think the big problem is we're still trying to, to live a spiritual life, but by old standards and by old means. We haven't discovered the new life that's in Christ Jesus or really what that means. We talk about it. We talk about our identity in Christ. We talk about victory in Jesus and power in the blood, but yet not too many people seem to be walking in much power in their life or much victory in their life. And, you know, we, we have to realize that when you come to Jesus, the change is radical. I mean, we, we don't necessarily notice this at fr in front. I mean, a lot of it we do, but it gets much more radical than just what we sense emotionally. I mean, uh, the, the world changes. Before you come to Christ, and even wh while we're in Christ, we're still being bombarded with a worldview that's contrary to God's view of things. It's a, it, the cultural standard is certainly not the norm of God's standard. It doesn't take a, a degree to figure that out, does it? I mean, you know that which way the world's going is certainly different which way the kingdom of God is going. But yet too many Christians are letting their mindset and their worldview and their approach to life, you know, come out of the world instead of out of the word of what God has to say for it. And I just, I, I kind of came up this message, I call it four-dimensional living, and experiencing Christ on every level of our, your, your life. And because I, I think that this is a little bit of what the problem talks. Let me, let me give you our, our passage of scripture, which I want to speak out of. It says, it's, it's in Psalms 50. It says, he who offers a sacrifice of thanksgiving honors me. And to him who orders his way aright, I shall show the salvation of God. Now, the, living, uh, the New Living Translation puts it this way. The, the giving thanks is a sacrifice that truly honors me. And if you keep my, to my path, I'll reveal to you the salvation of God. Now, and I love the, the context of what he's saying here. He says, if you really want to experience life and know what it's like to have the salvation of God on your life, then, then you order your way right. Now, I think we don't always understand this word salvation. If you look at this word salvation in the Old Testament, even in the New Testament, uh, it's, it's a little different than what most of us hit on when we first start thinking about salvation. When someone says, I have salvation... They, they're talking pretty much about, I'm not going to hell anymore. <laughs> you know, I'm going to go to heaven. I'm saved, all right? So I don't have to go to hell. I get to go to heaven. But that is, that is such a very minuscule part of this whole word of salvation. Uh, it, it's translated over and over in, in Scripture from an Old Testament word. Uh, sometimes it's translated different in the English language. Uh, most of the times this word for salvation is translated salvation, but there are other times when it's translated deliverance. Sometimes it's translated help. Sometimes it's translated health. Uh, sometimes it's translated welfare, prosperity. Uh, victory is another translation of it. But it all, it's all the same word. In other words, your salvation includes all of that. Not just heaven, not just escape from hell, but it includes fullness of life, real life. The abundant life is Jesus that have come that you might have that life that's abundant. Uh, that salvation involves that. Deliverance. You know, a lot of times we don't realize that salvation gives us what we need to be delivered from the sins that so plague our lives. That we don't have to do those things that we continually yield and give into. That salvation means deliverance. So we have deliverance. We have from the Lord. We have, we have his assistance. We have aid. We have victory from the Lord. So he said, listen, if you want to experience salvation in all that in your life and, in, and exp experience it in, in your walk of life and in, in your, your life experiences itself, where it's not just something you do at church, sing about and talk about, but it becomes a reality in your life, then that salvation comes from ordering your way aright. Now, Please understand, I, I know, I'm not talking about works. You give your life to Christ and salvation happens, right? But to experience that salvation in my life, there's got to be some, some decisions and some, some uh, changes and some disciplines in my life for me to really experience the blessings that God gave me that day when I received Christ Jesus as my Lord and Savior. You with me on this? 
Maybe this means uh-huh, okay? The, the, to, to fully experience what's been given to me, then I just can't sit by and thumb, thumb, you know, twiddle my thumbs. There's a life that's to be lived and choices that have to be made. And the Lord says, the way you experience this salvation, let me showing it to you and, you know, expressing in your life, it comes this way. You order your ways are right. You order your ways are right. Of course, the first order of that is ordering our way into the way, which is Jesus, all right? Uh, all too often, we've been living our, our way in the way of the world. There's really, by the way, only two ways. A lot of people think there's a lot of different ways. There's just two ways. There's, there's, there's right and wrong. There's saved and not saved. There's, there's with Jesus and without Jesus. You know, Jesus said, for me or against me, broad road, narrow road. You read scriptures and that clearly comes up throughout all of the, of the scriptures. It's, it's either you're on one path or the other. So the obvious thing to order my way right would get, get in the way with Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. I give my life and my heart to him. That's the first step. But he used this word. He said, by ordering your ways, it's this Hebrew word, sum, and it means to put something. In fact, it's translated as put 155 times in scripture, to make something 123 times, to set 119 times. But it's the same word used over and over and over. The Lord said, hey, you're going to have to make, you're going to have to set, you're going to have to put some things in order. And if you don't put these things in order, and if you don't set them in the right order, then you're not going to experience what God wants you to experience in your life. You're not going to experience the fullness of God that God has for you. So you're, you're going to have to make some decision. But what happens is when we don't put order, put the order to things and get the things, for, put it this way, in the right order, what happens? Well, that's when life just falls apart. Amen. Most of us attend a lot of things in our life, do a lot of things in our life, are busy about a lot of things in our life that really aren't important to the order of God's will for our lives. Uh, I shared before many years ago about this, the great secret to success. A businessman told me that he had had one time. He'd just gotten back from a conference. I ran into him in the Kroger's one night. And he was telling me he'd paid $1,000 to go to this conference. He was telling me all these wonderful things. And I said, well, just in a nutshell, because I'm always interested in learning. He said, what are the two best things you learned from the conference? I'll tell you what they are. It's pretty simple. I wrote them down. He said, number one, do what you know to do. And you can write this down. I won't charge you $1,000 for it. <laughs> do what you know to do. How much of the time do you find yourself doing things, you know, that aren't part of what you should be doing? You just do what you know to do. That's ordering. And the, obviously the Bible gives us a way to do that. There, we know what the order is if we just read the book, all right? Uh, you know, real men do read directions, by the way, all right? We read directions, and the directions come from the Word of God. Do what you know to do. And so the second one is equal to the first is don't do the things you shouldn't be doing. Stop doing those things. If you're not supposed to do them, don't do them. Well, that certainly would cert give a new twist of uh, fullness to most Christians' life. They do what they know they're supposed to do. Quit doing the things they shouldn't be doing. Oh, wow. Wow. That's what it has to mean by ordering, by setting these things, by making these decisions, by setting things in the proper path, in the proper order. You get your life in order. How much of our time is given over to things that are just not really valuable, nor important, nor necessary? The greatest thief, I think, of our time many times is we would attend to things and take care of things and pay attention to things that really aren't relevant, that really aren't all that important in our life. So what we should do is get our life in order. I don't know about you, but life in itself, much of the time, it can be chaotic. Certainly confusing at other times. So what do you do when it's chaotic and what do you do when it's confusing? Do the things you know to do. And it helps you sort between that which is good, that which is bad, that which is essential, that which is not essential. But for the Christian, and us experiencing the fullness of life that the Lord has for us, and you experiencing Jesus daily the way he wants you to experience him, you go back to that Psalms 50 verse when he says, he who offers a sacrifice of praise honors me, or a sacrifice of thanksgiving honors me. He who does what? Offers a sacrifice of thanksgiving honors me. And then you order your life correctly. So I think if you take notice of this, there's a little bit of, a, uh, of an insight here as to how we do order our life. The first, obviously, we're ordering it by, by giving thanksgiving to God. How do you honor God? I want to honor God. You want to honor God? Give thanks to God. Well, what's so honoring about God, this, this issue of thanksgiving? Well, he calls it there in, in chapter 50. He says, uh, it is a sacrifice of thanksgiving. You ever make a sacrifice of thanksgiving? What does that mean? That means you give thanks instead of something else. 
Normally, the easy path, the easy course is not thanksgiving. It's criticize. It's blame. It's complain. It's whine. It's moan. It's grumble. And that's the, that's, that's the normal course, right? Life situations, you know, happen in our lives. Do we stop? Give thanksgiving? I think one thing we have to learn about thanksgiving is it is first and foremost means a death to my will, my way, and my wants. I'm giving thanksgiving to God. I'm not complaining to God, not whining to God, not griping to God, you know. A lot of people think they're, they're prayer warriors. They spend all their time complaining on their knees. <laughs> That's not what we're doing. We're honoring God. How do you honor God? First of all, he said the sacrifice of thanksgiving. It means I die to myself, my preferences, my will, my way, my wish, my want. Because now instead of just saying whining about what I want, I'm saying, God, I choose to honor you. I give you thanks in all things. I'm going to honor you. I'm going to give you thanks. But you know what it does? In that same moment, in that same context, it causes me to lift my eyes up to heaven, to lift my eyes up to God, to change the, the, the course of which I'm, I'm getting ready to pursue. Because wherever I set my mind is what I'm going to attend to. Whatever I set my mind upon is where I'm going to go. I'm going to look to that direction. If I'm looking to God, then I'm on a good path to start going in the right direction so that I can order my life correctly. So I can make the necessary decisions or the changes that need to come in my life by Thanksgiving. It causes me to say no to myself and yes to God. God, I trust you. God, you're sovereign. God, I believe you. God, you're holy. God, you're right. God, I'm probably most likely wrong here. So I'm going to thank you. It recognizes that God is in charge. It recognizes that you trust him. It recognizes that you believe he's faithful. There's so much in this context. I mean, Thanksgiving itself, as we come up on the season of Thanksgiving, is a whole other sermon series. But I think it's important that these verses that are written here in Psalm, it's not like two different thoughts. They're blended together. You honor me and you order your ways aright. You honor me and you order your ways right. And at that point, I'll show you deliverance. I'll show you uh, the, the, the safety. I'll show you the salvation. I'll, 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 I'll show you the salvation of God. So we're getting our life in order. Now, it's important that we learn this principle about getting our eyes to the Father and turned upon the Father because we not, we're not geared that way. I mean, that's not the way you and I are, n- are normally wired. We're wired a different way. We're wired to... Just the opposite. Instead of Thanksgiving, we're complaining, right? Instead of being grateful, we're going to be gripey. I've watched some of you. Don't look at me like that. You've probably heard me. <laughs> That's the way we're wired. We're, we're wired, obviously, to the negative. But when Jesus comes into our lives and we're serious about a relationship with him and we're serious about our walk with him, things get changed. No longer are we the person we used to be. In fact, Paul writes to the Roman church, and he put it this way, that, that we're, not, we're, not spirit, we're not physical people anymore, living our life by just physical means. He said, now you're spiritual people. You know, this is part of this new person in Christ Jesus. We're no longer just a, a flesh and blood and body person. Physical world surrounds us. We're a physical being. We live our life by physical mandates. You see, what's that mean? If I'm living, living by that, the flesh, it means that I let things determine my attitude. I let things determine my direction and the course of my life, my words that come out of my mouth. In other words, if it's, if it's uh, rainy when I want it to be sunny, I let that determine my attitude. If it's traffic jam and I don't want a traffic jam, that determines my attitude. If my wife's not doing what I want her to, when I want her to do something else, she's doing something different, that affects my emotions. I let it determine me. If In the world, things aren't going the way I want them to go. And I I get upset about that. Then what's happening? I'm letting all these external things determine my attitudes, my behavior. I I just, it short circuits everything God wants to do. But that's that's living by the the flesh. It's my, my, my flesh acts in a certain way depending on the economy, depending upon my neighbor, depending upon the weather. All these other things now are in charge of how I'm going to live my life. So, well, I would never do that. Well, let's get real here. How often do you do that? I mean, I wish I could say I was guiltless, but I am not. I can let a group of folks putting down the road at 20 miles an hour in a 50 mile an hour zone get me ticked off. Amen. What's the matter with you people? Speed limit says 50. Can't you drive 50? Not 35. It's usually when I want to go home. I'm tired. It's been a long day. 
And for no reason at all, you got some guy sitting in front of me on his phone, texting, driving the same time, all over the highway. You know, am I the only person that runs in that guy? Oh, you're that guy. <laughs> Stop it. You're making everybody's life miserable. What I'm trying to say, my wife calls me up, up the, you know, the parent of the highway. He's out there telling all the kids how to drive correctly. Because I do. I'll talk to him out loud. Can you just pull over into your lane? If you speed it up, we'd all be happy. They don't hear me, but I think they do. And she just entertains and smiles all the time. <laughs> how often do we let these things just upset us? Now, that's, you know, that's, that's small potatoes. There's some bigger potatoes I could fry, but they ain't your business. <laughs> <laughs> you got some of your own, amen? But uh, what's it all come down to? It comes down to what Paul's trying to tell the church. He said, listen, that's not your life anymore. He says, hey, that's after the flesh, and you mind the things of the flesh, but now you're a spiritual person, so you're going to mind the things that are the spirit. What means to mind? It means to pay attention to. All too often we pay attention to this world, to the system, to what others are saying, to what the world's doing, to what things are going on, to what's an environmental situation. And I'm talking about in the context of the nice environment. I'm talking about the environment controls us. All right? We let these things just dictate our lives, the way we're going to behave, the way we're going to talk, the way we treat other people. We let these things just monitor us and rule in our hearts and lives. He said, well, that's not the way of the believer anymore. You're a spiritual being. And the whole context of this dimensional living is first and foremost, it's, it's, I'm realizing now that I'm in the spirit. Romans 8, just a few verses later, says, you, however, are not in the flesh. You're a Christian. You're in the spirit. And if, in fact, the spirit of God dwells in you, then you're in the spirit. If you have God in you, that means you're a spiritual being. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. So I have the spirit of God living in me as a Christian. So do you if you're a believer. We talked about this last Sunday. If you're a child of God, you have the Spirit of God in you, now that makes you a spiritual person, which gives you now a whole new way of living your life. You have a different set of eyes, so you can see things differently. You don't have to see it like the rest of the world anymore. You have a different set of ears, spiritual ears. If you'll listen carefully and quit listening to the report of the world and start hearing the report of God's Word, what has God said about the situation? It changes your life. You now mind the things of the Spirit, not the things of the flesh. But how often do we just simply fail right here and we give attention to this world and to the flesh much faster and much more readily than we do giving attention to the Spirit of God and to the spiritual things and to the Word of God. And we fall flat on our faith at this point. And so many Christians in our churches today, this is, this is where they, they walk in such an incomplete life and they miss the glory of a transformed life because they're allowing the flesh not just in traffic, but everywhere they are in their life, seem to dictate how they should live their life, how they should feel about the world, how they should feel about life. And what we mentioned in Ephesians when Paul is praying for the church is, listen, that you might come to, that, to, the, to the measure, the stature, the fullness of Christ. What does that mean? It means that we're learning how to live according to the Spirit of God. We're listening for the Spirit of God. We can hear the Spirit of God. And because of that, we're ordering our life. We've turned our face to God. We're honoring God. Our mouth is literally giving thanks unto God now. And now we're putting ourselves in a mindset and in a heart set to hear what the Spirit of God would say to us. Now, I know, and I've said it many times before, that every Christian, anybody who comes to Jesus, you're absolutely complete in Christ. Colossians says that you're complete in Jesus Christ. What does that mean? It means what you have, what you need in Jesus to be what God wants you to be. You don't sit around and beg God for something else. You got it already. I just need more patience. No, you got it. I got all, all the patience you need. I just need more of this. I just need more of that. I need more spirit. You got all the spirit you can, anybody else has. You have the same spirit that, 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 that was on, upon Jesus, that's on, in Paul. You have the same spirit. We are complete in Christ Jesus. But the problem is we mind the things of the flesh instead of the things of the spirit. We pay attention to what's going on with temptation, with trials, with Satan, with the world, all these things. And they hinder us from being what God called us to be. It's like a, if you just took a, 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 a corn seed, you know, just a seed of corn. In that seed, there's everything that is needed for that seed to become a full grown stalk bearing fruit of corn on it. The strokes in there, the roots are in there, the leaves are in there, the, the, the corn on the cob is in there. It's all there. It's in that seed. Only it's, one thing has to happen. That seed has to give up its life. It's the same thing for us. When we're willing to die to ourselves and give up our will, our way, all right, the flesh, then guess what happens? We can bloom 
and we can blossom. Jesus said when the, when the seed falls in the ground and it dies, then it brings forth life. That's the same for us. When we're willing to fall before the Lord and say, Lord, no longer me, but thee. That's what it means to offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving. Not me, God, but you, I honor you. I honor you. And at that point, we begin to order our lives correctly. Let me just give you a few things of what I mean to be this four-dimensional this four living, what I'm talking about. First and foremost, it is in the spirit. All this is in the spirit. But there's four aspects to your spiritual life that if you miss these, you're going to be pretty much incomplete. You're going to be walking on one level, so to say, living in one facet. But this thing of Christianity is like a diamond, multifaceted. The first is, and, and it's obviously the foremost and the important is this dimension of my relationship to my Savior. Jesus is my Savior. Jesus is my Lord. But I live my life towards him in relation to him. I can't be anything else that God wants me to be in life if I don't solve this issue. And this really is that daily issue of getting things right with God on a daily basis, ordering my life today by letting God have control of my life, surrendering my heart. My, this is expressed, my relationship with him is expressed in prayer, in thanksgiving, in reading his word, in communicating with him, in listening to him. All this has to do with my savior word aspect of my life. Let me ask you how that's working for you right now. Seriously, in your life right now, how is this, this facet of your Christian life where, where you and Jesus, where you're realizing more and more every day how important fellowship with him is? That it is key, it's vital, it's important or strategic. Or are you in your Christian life kind of struggling through things and acknowledging the Lord on many levels in your life, but you don't really spend time with him and you really don't spend time in his word and you're really not seeking God like the scripture tells us to do, pursuing God. You're kind of, you know, it's a, I come to church, I, I love Jesus, and I'm trying the best I can. That's a pitiful way to live your Christian life. It's, it's, not, it's a hard way to live a Christian life because you're not really living. You're trying to allow your flesh to kind of run things. And what happens is because there's such little spiritual uh, value being planted in your life as a, as a result of fellowship, and there's really no spiritual nutrition in your life. You're just spiritually struggling all the time. Things are tied at home. Things are tied in the office. Relationships are difficult. Finances, I mean, just, it's, just a, it's just a world of confusion. And, and it's a very simple thing, this whole idea of Christianity is. It's time with Jesus. Every day with Jesus. But there needs to be, I believe, an all-important strategic moment in your life where you start your day with Christ. And he has full control where, you, where you're surrendering, you're relinquishing control to your heavenly father. How often have we, we start a day, but we don't start it with Jesus and we just end up messed up. And we spend up the last part of our day uh, spending time in prayer just asking for forgiveness for everything we blew up. Amen. You want some victory in your life? You start it with Jesus. You want some victory in your life this week? You start with Jesus Sunday. You want some victory in your life in the day? You start the day with Jesus. You get that relationship between you and him right. This is ordering your way correctly. This is ordering your spiritual life correctly. You have an obligation. The second part of this is what we call saint word. What does that mean? That means your relationship to every other Christian, especially in your local church, other believers in your fellowship. How are things? Now, I know some of you consider yourselves a lone wolf. But you know what a lone wolf is? It's a lone wolf. Who wants to be that? <laughs> God never intended you to be alone anything. God intended you to be vitally connected to him and vitally connected to other Christians, other believers in Christ. If you read your Bible, if we just took the New Testament here, all right, which deals with this whole aspect of Christianity. And let's say my Bible starts right here is Matthew, first of Matthew, right in here. Give you an illustration. All right. That is Matthew 4, Matthew 2. That's, that's okay. Start right. Get that on camera. Matthew. You see my Bible? See how thick it is? All right. Can y'all tell the, how about thick that Bible is? So you see, there's one third of it here is all New Testament, right? New Testament. Now, let's take out Matthew and Mark and Luke and John, where we have the gospel. All right. Now, of this section here, you'll see one third of that is just the Gospels. You with me? Y'all blind like I am? Hope you can see on the screen up there, right? <laughs> one third of that is, is the Gospels. Two thirds of it 
deals with the church. How we live our lives. How we navigate the days that we're in, even the end times. In fact, not even, you get into Revelation pretty much, you start doing just the end times, so we take that out. What am I saying? The majority of the New Testament tells you how you need to be a part of a local church. Not a church universal, because I love people, well, I'm a part of the universal church. You know what that means? That means you sleep in on Sunday. <laughs> Amen. That means you don't put up with anybody. You don't have to deal with problems. You don't have to deal with relationships. You don't have to get, you know, uh, you know I don't want to deal with other people. But that's not the Christian life. There's no place for a Christian who's not a part, as far as you read the New Testament, the only place you see a Christian who's not a part of a, of a local church are people who are being rebuked in Scripture for not assembling with other believers. There's no positive words of encouragement there, you know, because they're not being what they're called to be. I spent some time on the phone with a person this week who has some different theological ideas than probably you have and stuff. But I, my simple question is, so where are you going to church now? Well, I really hadn't found a church that, that, that worked. I talked to somebody else this morning, Magnolia Camp. Where are you going to church now? Because they'd moved out of the, out, out of, out of the, out of the city. There's in, in another part of the state, another state even. And I said, where are you going to church? Oh, we hadn't found a church yet. Well, it's been a year. Well, it's hard to find a church. One on every corner. <laughs> It's hard to find a good church. There's a lot more out there than you realize. All right? But you need to find one and you need to be a part of it. You can't function just out there by yourself. It's just, it's not the biblical way. It's not the Christian way. It's not the Jesus way. You're part of the body of Christ. You're part of the bride of Christ. All right? And you're to, to function as a bride. But you're not an individual, just one little cell. Of the, you're, you're part of the bride, which is a body, which is a group. There's no way that, that you, can, you can sufficiently live a Christian life isolated. Well, I go on Sundays. Well, good for you. But you need to be involved in ministry. You need to be involved in, in Bible study with other believers. You need to be involved in prayer with other believers. You need to bear other people's burdens. You need to be concerned. You need to be finding out what's going on. They need to be finding out what's going on with you. Well, I don't want people to know what my business is. Well, I'm sorry. This is the church. We know each other's business around here. We pray for each other. We don't, we don't try to hide our issues. We, I, need to, I got a brother I can pray with, a sister you can pray with. I mean, you want somebody to help you with your burden. I mean, everybody has to know you, male. <laughs> But we need each other. We need the body of Christ. I, I mean, I, I went to that football game Sunday night. I'll confess my sins. Here's after saying, if they'd won, it wouldn't have been a sin. <laughs> but I remember sitting there watching all these people, 70,000 people screaming. Majority of them were saying, we're Texans, we're Texans. Watched them come in to the gates and file into the, the stadium and went down the sidelines and everybody's running around and it's got their Texan shirts on, their Texan hats on, their Texan tennis shoes or whatever they might have, you know, their banners and their pom-poms and all their stuff they got going. And everybody's yelling, what are you? I'm a Texan, Texans. They're not Texans. They're fans. Who are Texans? This is a guy beating each other on the field down there. Button heads with those other guys. They're Texans. I told you about the time I ran into a guy who told me he's a pro football player. What do you team you play for? He said, I don't play for a team. I used to play and I'm looking for a team now. Well, you're not a pro football player. You're not on a team. You're not a player. We've got a lot of people who say they're on a team, but they never play. We've got a lot of fans in the church. Amen. We're Christians. We're believers fellowshippers. Hey, go BF. But they don't do squat. Can't find them half time without a search warrant. <laughs> Come church once a month at best. And then you got the CEOs. You know what that is. Christmas and Easter only, guys. <laughs> right? You're not a Texan. Unless you're showing up for practice. Unless you're learning the, the, the game plan book. You're not a Texan. All right? Unless you're busting helmets with somebody else. You're not a Texan. Hey, you'll be a, to be a member of Believer's Fellowship, we tell this people from 101 class on, it means you're involved in other people's lives. It means you're doing ministry. There's so many things that you can do and be a part of from, from, the, from the obvious things like prayer and care and share to the other areas of ministry that should just manifold around here. Just opportunity after opportunity for you to serve the Lord. There's opportunity after opportunity. To be a Believer's Fellowship means that during the week, I invite people to my church. Why? Because I'm a believer's fellowshipper. That's what we do. It means that I see somebody in need in the world, I can reach out and I can pray for them. I can, I can express my faith to other people. I can talk about Jesus. So my team does that. It's what we do. But you know, so many Christians, they're missing this element in their life. 
They'll be content to watch some preacher on TV or even live streaming. And that'll be church for them. But you need your fellowship with other believers. The Bible makes it clear, do not neglect the assembling of yourselves together. Amen. And so why, why a lot of Christians hurt today? Because they're not ordering their lives properly. Amen. It's not just Savior word, it's saint word, but it's also, we've been talking about last couple weeks, so I want to deal here long, which is we, we do have responsibility out in the world for that sinner word kind of thing, right? That's another as aspect of my spiritual life. It's, it's a, an important aspect of my spiritual life. And if I leave this off, then, then, you know, what am I here for? Jesus said, make disciples of the world. Go make disciples. We all have responsibility. That's not, well, that's the, I'll leave that to the evangelists. We're all evangelists. Right. We all should be sharing the good news. We're all making a difference. We're all lights. We're all salt if we're a child of God. So we're here. We have that relationship. The fourth relationship is an important one. It's this dimension of realizing I am in a war zone. All right? There, there's a, and a lot of Christians, they don't want to think about this and they don't want to talk about this and they're just letting the enemy run all over their life because they're not smart warriors. You know, people that aren't smart warriors are dead ones, are wounded many times, all right? Because they're not, they're not using their, their spiritual mind. They're not reading the, the word. They, they're not taking their sword and their shield with them, all right? They're not arming themselves or equipping themselves with the whole armor of God. The first part of my day with Jesus on the Savior word thing, I, you know, I, you got to get up and get dressed, folks. More than just in a physical way. You got to get dressed spiritually. You don't want to go to work naked. You don't want to go to war naked. And you're in a war with the enemy. You have, a, you, have, you have this entity, this real spiritual being out there named Lucifer who hates you. And has one goal for your life, to keep you from knowing God. Secondary is if you can't do that, he's going to keep you from being effective for God and experiencing God in your life. So he'll do everything he can. You can be sure that some of the battles you fight tomorrow are very spiritual battles. Some will be just a contest over your flesh. Some will be the world trying to influence you. And some will be just directly the enemy sending some little demon along your path trying to seduce you, lie to you, steal from you, rip you off on some level. So you, you have to be ready for war. You can't say, well, I don't like to think about the devil. I don't get scared of the devil. Let me tell you, you realize how you, who you are. The devil's scared of you. That's why he fights you so hard. You know, he, he, he doesn't want you to be who God made you to be. He doesn't want you to discover who you really are. He doesn't want you to know how much power and authority you have over him. And the beauty of that is that God took puny little man, redeemed him, put his own Holy Spirit inside of him, and now gave that puny little man and all of the creatures of creation, the mighty host of heaven, the angelic beings of great power, authority, and dominion. And God raised up a man and gave him his authority. And now we have authority over the enemy. And we don't have to do what he says. Amen. We don't have to go where he tells us to go. We don't have to act how he tells us to act. We don't have to be what he's called us to be and tells us to be. We can be what God wants us to be. But we have to, we have to enter the field, you know, in the morning when I'm doing my Savior word thing in the day, I'm saying, Lord, also clothe me in armor today because I do realize that part of my conflict is a very spiritual conflict. And I need to have my sword, which is the word of God in my hand, in my heart and in my life. And I need to have my shield in the other hand because you know when you walk out there with that shield, you better hold it up and you better be ready because Satan's coming with those little fiery darts. You say, what are those? There are things like, you know, you really can't do that. Are, are you, you, you're really not smart enough. Or you really can't tell somebody about Jesus because you don't have what it takes. And you're a wimp and you're a coward. And you know, you, you, you want your way more than you want to give up your way. And hey, why don't you tell your wife, put her in her place. And you know, why don't you tell your husband, take a hike. And you know, <laughs> those are just fiery darts. They're innumerable sometimes in some days, are they not? Stuff like, nobody cares about you. Nobody cares about you. Why should you care about anybody else? And on and on and on. And on and on they come against our life on every level. It's no way. It's so hopeless. It'll never work out. You can't do that. Those are fiery darts. How do you deal with them? You raise your shield up. And it's the shield of what? Faith. Faith basically says, I don't care what you say. I believe God. I trust God. 
God before me, who can be against me? That's when those, those darts, now they can't lodge themselves into your little brain up here and start filling you with all kinds of defeat and despair and depression and doubts and frustration. Little fiery darts that tell you, oh, well, you deserve this. Or little fiery darts that you don't have to pay attention to what God says. God really loves you. He'll forgive you anyway. Those are all just fiery darts. And that's when you hold up the shield and say, I choose to believe truth. I choose to believe God. I choose to live for Jesus. I choose to hear what God says. That's where the word comes in. You have to have both. But what happens to the fiery darts? They are quenched at the presence of faithfulness, of faith in your life. They're quenched and they're put out and they are defeated. Amen. Somebody praise the Lord. But that little puny thing up here in my skull that's called a brain is not wired that way. So I have to make a decision. I'm going to be wired this way. I think I'll just, I'm not as smart as I think I am. I think I'll just believe God. I told someone not too long ago who was struggling with this issue of reality of God and creation, these things, these miracle acts of God. I just struggle over that. I said, uh, how's your life for Jesus? Well, I'm not really living for the Lord right now. I said, well, I really don't think it's your great mind that's the problem. I don't think it's your great intellect. I think it's your weak heart. I think it's your weak heart. You're just not going to believe God, are you? You're going to trust the Lord. That's what it always comes back to in our life, though. Will it come back to faith, reason, logic, or trust? Well, the logical thing, Brother Joe, is, no, but what's the, what's the biblical thing? We're not in the flesh. So if you want to live your life in a way that's going to be different, then you have to live it by the Spirit. And that's another world of operation, and it's another rules of operation. And all is found in the Word of God. Let's look at your life. You got these four dimensions. How's it, how's it, how you nav- nav- navigate these? These all are just intertwined with each other. But they're very unique aspects of your spiritual life. And you need to pay attention to each and every one of them. First and foremost, that one, because you get this first one off towards Jesus, it messes up everything if it's off. Can I get a witness? And I, sometimes I think, you know, when I'm talking to you guys, I think I'm the only one in the room that's failed. <laughs> I'm just trying to be honest with you and I'm trying to be transparent but at the same time I want you to know that in my failures I've found success in Jesus hallelujah always in Christ Jesus let's stand with our heads bowed would you fathers we come to you in this time this moment